Much like a lot of things in photography, you have to understand the boring stuff in order to be better at the fun stuff. For example, being able to read histograms and scopes so that you can be better at color correcting, grading, and exposure. These are essential tools to help you with your edits, and I pretty much use them on every edit that I do. But they can be a bit tricky to understand, so in this video, I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know about scopes inside Affinity Photo. So for starting out, the way you can find your scopes inside the Photo Persona is by coming up to View, down to Studio, and then down to Scope. From here, you have a movable window that you can dock anywhere that you'd like as well. And so now just going down the list that we have here, let's start out with the intensity waveform. And this is basically a way of seeing your exposure. So the X axis of this is the horizontal position of your pixels. So essentially everything you see on the left here is related to everything on the left of your image. Everything on the right over here is related to the right of your image. Now the Y axis here is the luminance value of the pixels in your photo. We can see right where she is in this graph because the luminance value is much higher and we can see that in the photo here because she is a much lighter part of the image compared to everything else which is displayed in the scope over here. And we can show this as well if we were to add something like an exposure adjustment layer and we change this, we like really brighten it, we can see that everything moves up to the very top here because now we're very overexposed and we have pure white in our image which is what the very top of this graph is. Or if we deeply underexpose like this, you can see that our scope moves to the very bottom there because now we're seeing pure black, which is what the very bottom of the scope is. So basically this is just a nice way of seeing your exposure of your image from left to right. And another example with this is if we were to just use a gradient from white to black from left to right, you can see how that's translated into the scope as well. Because on the very far left over here we have pure white, which is what we have up here, and then it fades down into black on the right side of the image. So essentially the intensity waveform is used to see your exposure of your image and exactly where you might be peaking in your image so that you can better adjust the exposure of your photo in certain parts. Now moving on to the RGB waveform, it's literally the exact same thing as the intensity waveform, but this time we have RGB values in here as well. So as you can see in the scope, we have our different RGB values as well as the intensity of those colors. Now this is nice, but in all honesty, I don't use this one very often because the next one, which is the RGB Parade, makes things a lot easier to read because just like the previous two, it reads the exact same way, but this time the RGB is split so it's easier to read. So for example, if we're looking at our image and we can't quite tell what's wrong with it, so let's say in our shadows, maybe we have a little bit too much red in our shadows. We can see that displayed in the scope over here because our red values are a little bit higher than our green and blue channels. So this is a great way of seeing what colors need to be adjusted inside your photo. But with that we're going to move on to the next one which is the power spectral density scope. Now this one is pretty tricky to understand but I'm going to try my best to explain it. This is essentially a way of showing you high and low frequencies of color shift inside your image. So if you've ever worked with something like frequency separation, you'll understand kind of like the high and low frequencies, and it's kind of the same principle being applied here. So the high frequencies, which are basically dramatic shifts from one color to another, is going to be displayed as noise on this scope. Whereas the low frequencies, which basically means a more gradual shift from pixel to pixel, is going to be shown as the lines. So with those lines, the x-axis here is going to show our pixel shifts from left to right, and the y-axis here is our pixel shifts from top to bottom. In a way, you can kind of think of the scope as reading sharpness, or even maybe see noise in your image that you didn't see previous. So to better kind of explain this, essentially what we can do is we can add a little bit of Gaussian blur to our image. So if we blur those pixels, essentially making them more of a lower frequency, so that the shift from pixel to pixel is a lot more gradual. You can see how that's displayed in the scope over here, because the more we blur it, the more these are gonna turn into lines, whereas the less we blur it, the more noise we're gonna have. And like I said before, you could also maybe see something like noise in your image that you haven't seen previously, so maybe there's some noise that you didn't notice before, and you can see that displayed as noise in the scope. And one more thing I forgot to mention with this, you'll notice that these lines actually have a color to them, and that is essentially related to the color that is most prominent in that frequency. So for example, we have a lot of low frequency green in here, especially going from left to right, which is displayed here. I hope that mostly makes sense. I know it's kind of hard to understand, and if I'm being completely honest, I've never found a proper use for this scope, but maybe you'll have a use for this. 
but either way, that's how you read the power spectral density scope. But moving on to our next one is going to be the vector scope. So the vector scope just deals with hue and saturation. And to prove this, I'm going to show you that if we were to make this image black and white, you can see that this scope is essentially not used at all because with this signal here in the center, the further it is from the center, the more saturated your colors are, whereas the closer they are to the center, the less saturated their colors are. So if we have a black and white image, obviously there's no saturation of color, which means that there's no signal being displayed in the vector scope. And with that, you can also see which colors are being saturated. So in this, we have a lot of green saturation, which is shown here because we have this part that's coming out over here. And then we also have her skin tones, which is where the scope is really useful because this line right here indicated with an eye is our skin tone line. With any edit that you're doing, anyone, regardless of their ethnicity, will have a skin tone that will fall onto this line. So when you're messing around with your colors, you want to make sure that your skin tones still fall onto that line. If we were to shift the hue of our entire image over here, you can see that those skin tones are now way off the line which is a little bit dramatic, so I'm just gonna bring that back a little bit. But you can see that her skin tones are a little bit off the line and leaning more towards the red over here. And we can kind of see that in the photo as well, because now it kind of looks like she has a little bit of a sunburn. So if you ever wanna make sure that your skin tones are coming off as natural in your photos, you can use that skin tone line on the vector scope to make sure that they are natural. As I was saying before also, the further away that these are from the center, the more saturated they are. So for example, with this, if we were to make this super saturated, you can see just how far away we get from the center in the vector scope, whereas we bring it much further down, it's a lot more centered. So like I said before, this is a great way of seeing your hue and saturation, but most of the time, I'm just using this scope to make sure my skin tones are accurate and natural. But that pretty much does it for the scopes. You should now have a pretty good understanding of what each of the different scopes actually do and how to read them inside Affinity Photo. But that pretty much does it for this video. If you guys have any suggestions on something you'd like me to cover, be sure to leave it in the comments below. If you liked this video, please consider liking and subscribing. I hope you guys have a great day. See ya.